I'm more than happy to answer questions about anything specific you might have um, after the talk. So you can all reach out to me on social media. Um, on my uh, Instagram is probably the easiest way to reach me. Um, and I'll do my best to answer questions. Um, so basically, um, what I wanted to talk to you guys today is about brand building and authenticity. And that, you know, not only is like what I do, but I think is building your application for um, medical school or your medical career. It's really important to kind of understand your brand, so to speak, and where um, where you come from and what your goals are in your career. Um, and that's with building your application um, and whether that be that or um, developing your social media platform. Um, so yeah, so I'm just gonna kind of get started. Um, I, um, like she said, I'm a neurosurgeon. I practice in Georgia. Um, I have um, been in practice for almost 10 years, seems crazy, but um, I um, am born and raised in Georgia and I did my training in neurosurgery at Duke and finished in 2013. I did a spine fellowship. So I mostly um, do private practice and I specialize uh, in spinal surgery. Um, so, so yeah, who am I? Of course, I told you that. Um, I am a physician to many patients. I'm um, Betsy to my husband and, um, and to my friends. Um, and I'm a mom to two wonderful kids and uh, two dogs. And of course, many of you guys probably know me on social media, um, which I've kind of like um, developed my platform over the past like 12 to 18 months. Um, and I've been super um, honored by the outpouring of followers that I've gotten on these platforms and um, really just honored to be here to talk to you guys and um, excited just to kind of share my experience. Um, so I'm going to use a little bit of interaction with um, this talk to kind of keep it lively and keep it fun. Um, so if, if any of you guys do follow me on social media, you may have seen some of these videos. Um, but this is kind of um, how I approach things um, and talks is just kind of using some of my videos to interact. So um, I just wanted to kind of introduce like myself. When you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, how much you have to fight the urge to say, wow, well, these other bitches aren't even close. Get me going. So um, that is um, by, far, by far my most um, popular, most viewed video on TikTok. Um, and it kind of just has been my, um, kind of the focus or center of, of my brand building is just kind of being, um, honest, uh, with myself and who I am. Um, and so I think being, you know, being a pre-med student and being in the medical field is all about being yourself and being unapologetically yourself. And that's kind of how I approach every part of my life. Um, because, you know, I'm not ashamed of who I am. And um, I think it's important, um, not only for your future building, but just to realize like why you're here, you belong here, and what, um, what pros and cons that you can bring um, to your career and why you wanna do this. So, and, you know, building a brand is like a term that we use on social media, but it really is like building your brand or your application um, for your future. So whatever you do now is really starting to build your brand as to who you will become um, long-term. So, you know, I think building a brand is something that's important with, um, you know, having a successful career, um, family life, um, being personally happy and getting a sense of fulfillment. Um, so, um, why neurosurgery or why did I choose to go into medicine um, altogether? So I'll just use this so video. I just wanted to take a few minutes and explain why I went into one of the most competitive fields in medicine. Why would somebody like me want to become a neurosurgeon? It really comes down to me wanting to be just like my mom. She was beautiful and she was a badass. She was a female cop in the 90s and I just thought that she was just the epitome of cool. She was in the honor guard. She was on the dive team. And then one day, just like that, in the middle of the night, everything changed. She was bilingual, so she worked night shift in the hardest part of town. Gang activity in the 90s in that part of town was incredibly high. She saw some people on private property that weren't supposed to be there, so she decided to go check it out. And 
They shot at her car. And this is what happened. She tried to dodge the bullets and hit a tree and was instantly quadriplegic. I was 14 years old when her neurosurgeon came to us and said that she would never walk again. So my desire to become a neurosurgeon was from that moment forward in which I wanted to help people just like her. By the way, she's still a badass. This is her carrying the Paralympic torch in the 94 Olympics. And this is her at my wedding. So 28 years later, here I am reaching out on this platform, sharing my story with all you guys, sharing the knowledge that I have learned and helping people. And that is why I do what I do. So we all, you know, have our stories um, and why we want to become doctors. And, um, you know, not everybody's story is like mine and most people's stories are not like mine. Um, but, you know, I think just realizing what is the focus of why you're going to, why you want to go into the medical field is extremely important to kind of building your application and creating a cohesive um, solidified application so medical schools can really see who you are and what you bring to the table because compassionate people that have a reason to do what they do are, are the ones that are going to make great physicians and you can see through that um, well on applications instead of like you know just kind of having a little bit of experience here and here and here and here and it kind of being all over the place it's best to take your strategy and try to focus it in on one um, aspect so you can really kind of build your brand so to speak um, so um, this next video um, just kind of shows my education um, the very so, abbreviated version of my story because all you guys always ask is that my mom was involved in a car accident when I was 13 years old she was injured in the line of duty as a police officer and was paralyzed from a c4 spinal cord injury Obviously, this was a very traumatic experience for me. I was just kind of starting high school. So I went through her recovery with her and actually become a certified nursing assistant. I did this to help learn how to take care of her and uh, went through high school wanting to really understand spinal cord injury and why this could happen to somebody, like why they would never be able to move again. So I became very interested in spine surgery and in spinal cord injury and trauma. And I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, so I started shadowing her neurosurgeon. I then went on to college and obtained a four-year Bachelor of Science degree in biology and pre-med, and it was accepted into medical school at that time in my state school. My mom, unfortunately, had some deterioration of her medical condition at that time, and so I took a year deferment and went on to be a triage assistant for another neurosurgeon in our town. I then um, learned a lot from that experience. My mom actually got a lot better. I went on to medical school and did four years of medical school in my state. I became very integrally involved in the neurosurgery department at my medical school and um, started obtaining a lot of good mentors that could guide me in the right direction. I did some papers on neurosurgery. I gained a lot of experience, had a lot of good mentors and sub eyes, and I went on to match in neurosurgery at Duke. Obviously, I was very blessed to match at such a renowned institution, and I learned a ton during my residency who made me into the surgeon that I am today. I did an enfolded spine fellowship and was looking for jobs, which I wanted to come back to the area in which I kind of started this whole process, which turns out to be the same practice in which my mom's surgeon worked at that I shadowed in high school, and then I was also a triage uh, assistant for that surgeon I took in my one-year deferment. So I took a job there doing private practice in which I have been doing for nine years. It is the hometown in which I grew up in. I actually work in the hospital in which I was born and I serve the community in which I grew up with. It was ex extremely rewarding. So the bottom line is that life comes full circle. You never know where you're gonna end up. You never know which life events and life experiences will bring you to become the person who you are today. And I am just so lucky to have had all these experiences to lead me to where I am today. I love being on social media so I can really kind of show my experience uh, to all those uh, future physicians out there or anyone that thinks that they may want to do neurosurgery. I had no doctors in my family and in fact I was the first person in my family to graduate college. So I hope my voice reaches some of you guys out there to show you that you can indeed do whatever you want. So good luck. So, you know, I think my path um, is like most of you guys. I mean, I really didn't have any doctors in my family. I had nobody to kind of look up to um, and, and 
my pre-med pathway. Um, I just knew that I wanted to do it. And um, I gained experience along the way um, with shadowing, you know, um, her surgeon and actually took a year deferment. Like I mentioned, I got accepted into medical school early admission, um, but took a year deferment because I, it, I wasn't ready to start school. My mom was very sick. Um, she uh, almost died at that time. And I knew that it was too much going on and I didn't want to mess anything up. So I um, did what was right for me at that time and took a year deferment, which I'll um, think was probably, you know, what I needed at that time. And, and if I had like went through medical school my first year and um, didn't do well, I may not be where I am today. I may not have matched into neurosurgery. So I think it's just important to really understand what's going on in your life and how you can achieve your end goals. Um, and, you know, for me, I went to a public undergraduate um, institution, University of Georgia. I didn't go to Duke or Yale or Harvard. And when I went to medical school, I went to my state school where I could save money and I got an early admission. Um, I applied to lots of other schools. I got into several other schools, but I chose to stay in my public school because I felt most comfortable doing that. Um, I knew I was going to be closer to home and my family is very important to me. So I knew that in order to be successful in medical school, that it that being location wise close to who I loved and who my support system was, was going to help me do that. And I think that's really important um, in the application process to realize that, hey, if you want to be a nurse surgeon, you don't have to, or a cardiac surgeon or whatever you want to do, you don't have to go to, you know, the best medical school. You want to go to where the best medical school for you. And that that may vary depending on what your goals are. I mean, maybe you do need to go to Duke or Harvard or whatever, but, um, you know, for me that um, all those decisions really led me to where I am today. And um, I'm just so thankful that I was um, made all those decisions along the way. And some of them may not have been the best, but um, here we are. So I think, you know, just with that being said, there's three things in my mind that I think are successful um, to developing your career is, you know, making sure that this is the right career for you, um, making sure, and it's probably too soon about specialty, but if you're someone like me who really knew the specialty um, that you wanted to be in, um, knowing that early is helpful, but not necessary. Um, the right partner in life, you may not be anywhere near finding a partner in life. I mean, that's okay. I didn't meet my husband until I was 29 years old. So understanding, you know, in my pre-med career that I was, my, my partner in my life was my best friend at that time. And just aligning yourself, I think, with the right people that will get to you where you want to be and putting people in your life that are positive and not toxic because those kind of people really don't support you to get to where you want to be. So recognizing that and the people that build you up, not tear you down is extremely important because honestly, you don't need that in your career to get you to where you are. And um, I think that's really important. And the biggest thing is self-love and self-confidence. Um, you didn't get to where you are. You didn't get the grades that you got for not doing anything. And I think so many of us are overwhelmed by imposter syndrome. And I think it's really very um, um, undeserving. I mean, we all, I do it too, still in, in um, uh, not as much now, but, um, you know, we, we all think that we shouldn't be somewhere. We sh we're not good enough or, you know, maybe we didn't get the right grade. We didn't deserve that. And, you know, that's not true. I mean, you worked hard to get to where you are and understanding and taking care of yourself and having the confidence in yourself is extremely important um, in these. And so all of these things have led me to build my own brand, if you will. And um, from for my patients and everyone to kind of see me as a specialist in my in my field and an educator. And most of all, what's most important to me is being a compassionate uh, provider. <clears throat> so, you know, choosing the right career will vary for me. It was you know, what I wanted to do because I was very passionate about spine, um, joining um, the practice in my hometown. Um, all those things were led me to pick the practice in which I did. Choosing the life partner, like I said, I didn't um, meet my husband until I was well, um, about halfway through residency. Um, but that, that partner you may meet early in your life and you may not meet um, early in your life. But, you know, realizing that there has to be aligned goals there. You have to be supportive. Communication is so important, daily dialogue, and that changes even as your career changes. Maybe different from what you are as a pre-med as to what you are as a resident, what you are as an attending, because certainly what I needed to do in residency and what I do now is so different 
And, you know, we're adaptive and supportive of each other, which I think is incredibly important. And like I said, having confidence in yourself, being comfortable, um, not having imposter syndrome, having faith in your skill set and your knowledge base, and knowing that you belong here. Um, so um, I just kind of threw this in um, just as a slide that kind of shows applicants to matriculants and to see that, you know, the applicants kind of fluctuate um, over the years. So there's, you know, sometimes really big spikes in applicant pools, but the matriculants really just kind of, or the people that get accepted into medical school has been slowly, slowly growing. And you can see that, you know, men versus women in there as well. And I don't know what happened with the spike in um, 2021. I assume maybe COVID people got really compassionate about healthcare. I'm not sure, but um, it's just interesting, I think, to see the kind of um, trends. Um, and really, you know, about if you look at this data, I mean, 60,000 people applied to medical school in 2022 and only 25,000, 22,000 got accepted. So there's not everybody's going to get accepted on your first round. My best friend um, in college, um, she, it took her three attempts to get um, accepted into medical school and she ended up going the DO route because that was what was important to her. She wanted to do primary care and um, and so, anyway, I think, you know, not acknowledging that you are a good applicant and you may not get accepted the first round and how can you make your application stronger for the next cycle. So, um, and like I said, building a cohesive application is important. Um, a well-rounded student is going to be a better doctor. And I think that's what the, uh, I'm not on an uh, um, admissions uh, team, um, but, you know, I think it's it's pretty clear to see someone compassion for the field is very obvious um, and that'll set you apart from just everybody else in that big applicant pool that I just showed you and so just like I said being true to yourself being consistent and like I said when you if you do get multiple acceptances making sure you understand that the location of your school may you know not necessarily the best school but the best school for you essentially and and those um, may be very different person to person Okay, so social media is an interesting um, beast um, that I've learned over the past few years and continue to learn. Um, and I think as pre-meds, like I didn't have social media as a pre-medical student. I kind of wish I did, but I kind of wish and don't wish I did. But I think it would be helpful to see people like me um, and what I could do. Um, but also it's kind of intimidating as a pre-med student. I see a lot of pre-meds. That's actually how I got hooked up with this um, lecture today and being involved in this is, um, is from student pre-med students that are on social media. So I think, you know, social media platform can help you tremendously, but it can also harm you. So you need to learn how, um, you know, to do it, to do it well, um, because, you know, we can really kind of significantly impact who we are um, on social media and who we're portraying ourselves to be on social media um, based on, you know, what your end goals are. So I've just taken three different um, social media accounts that most of you guys probably follow and um, just want you to kind of like put yourself to like what's the first word that comes to mind when you see this account and um, and realize that you have formed their opinion on that person based on what their brand is because that's who they set themselves up for on social media and that information is very easily accessible. So Dr. Glockham Flecken, um, you know, um, my initial thoughts for him is he's a comedian. Um, he's very entertaining. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, uh, that's his brand. Um, the Daisy Sanchez is a surgery resident. Um, you know, she built herself on feminism and, and being sexy. Um, and that's also okay, but that's her brand. Um, and then uh, Dr. Tommy Martin, who I also follow, I kind of see him as like a dad and a triathlete and that's his brand. And so, you know, understanding like the kind of content that you post is who you are and who you want to portray yourself to be. And I don't know what you guys think of me, but um, but yeah, it's just, you know, really, like I said, just being unapologetically who you are, but also appropriately doing so. Um, so why did I start using social media? I, um, I wanted to break the stereotype of neurosurgeons, to be honest with you. I wanted to show who I was. I wanted to share my journey. Um, I didn't know any female neurosurgeons in my entire, even in residency, I had one female neurosurgery attending and she was pediatrics. So I had nobody to look up to as a, as a female. 
Um, and so all my, all my kind of, um, uh, mentors were, were men, which is okay. Um, but I, you know, wanted to be able to show other women out there because neurosurgery is such a, a male dominated field that they can do it. You can have a family, you can be normal. You don't work at the hospital all the time. Um, cause that's what we kind of think. Um, and that's what we kind of know based on our experiences with others. And then also I really wanted to educate people on an understandable level, which I feel like is one of my um, strong suits is really taking something very complex and breaking it down on a level that anybody can understand. And that's what I do a daily in my practice. And that's how I've been successful in my practice is really communicating and, and explaining. So all of those things is kind of how I built my brand um, on social media. So um, why did I start using it? Um, during the pandemic, like most people started using um, TikTok, um, I used the app for a few little videos, kind of having fun, you know, it's bored. Um, I wanted to build my Instagram platform actually, and um, started using the TikTok app to make videos because it's a lot easier to use it in TikTok than in Instagram. And then I would download it and then share it to Instagram. And so I did a few videos um, on there, but on TikTok is very uh, interesting because the way you can grow on there is so much um, easier than on on Instagram. And so I made this particular video um, on TikTok, but not meant to gain any followers or anything, but more so I could put it on my Instagram. And so this is it. Of this today, I would be so freaking embarrassed of this video for a multitude of ringing reasons. One is, I mean, like the beat was music was totally off. Um, I was horrible at dancing. Um, two, my hair is pulled back. Three, the angle is terrible. I wasn't wearing any makeup. It wasn't wasn't cute. wasn't good. Um, but it went viral, and, and I like to think it's because it was funny. But it's probably also because I was horribly off rhythm, and I got a lot of comments on that. But the video just generated a lot of engagement and got circled around in a spiral. Um, but most of all, I got a lot of good comments from um, from people just like like intrigued with what I did. So I was like, okay, well, there must be something to that um, being a woman in this field. And you know, I had multiple medical people that I followed, and um, and um, I I just I said, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just give this a whirl. In two months, I'm gonna post every day um because that's what all the people at social media tell you to grow your content you need to post daily so i just made a um I made a deal with myself that i would do it every day this is september of 2021 and um within 2 months i had like 50,000 followers on um tiktok and the other platforms not so much but i didn't really post a lot on there um because i really wasn't sure about all the platforms but fast forward you know a year and a half later um, where I've kind of adapted into multiple platforms. I'm sharing very similar content, um, but I've got almost, like she said, a million followers on TikTok, 150 on Instagram, 200,000 on Facebook, and uh, just started YouTube um, because it was a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Um, but I started YouTube mostly to archive my content and organize my content, and it's already grown to 60,000. So I'm really not doing this for the money. I mean, you can monetize this stuff. But it's more to just kind of share my brand and it's just become a fun kind of hobby for me really um and it became so much work really because of i'm a full-time mom i'm a full-time neurosurgeon that i couldn't do it on my own and so I, I hired actually my best friend to do it so basically what i monetize for my content essentially just pays for, for her um so i think you know choosing your username is important your brand name um you know you want your name to represent who you are whether that just be your name um, for me, I wanted something kind of catchy or like, I can't, sometimes I can't remember people's names. Um, and so I'm like, what was that person's name again? But I just want something, oh, that lady, that lady spine doctor or whatever. So that's how I kind of came up with this. And I have a funny backstory on a, um, a very misogynistic encounter with a patient's family early in my career where um, I went to talk to a patient's family and he was just so like, um, didn't believe that I was a surgeon. He was just like, 
Wow, I just cannot believe that was a lady back doctor. Good for you. And it was so, like, really kind of degrading and embarrassing. But also, he was, like, very sweet. Like, he really meant it from a good place. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of, like, one of the reasons why I developed that name, um, Lady Spine Doc, which is stuck. Um, and actually, when I started Instagram, if any of you guys have been following me for a while, actually, I started my Instagram as Dr. Grunch. And then TikTok was Lady Spine Doc because that was, like, my Peloton name. And I realized that I needed to kind of brand everything together. And I would recommend that if you are developing a social media platform, that you keep it consistent across all platforms. So you're kind of... So it's interchangeable and pretty easy. Um, so, yeah, so that was my spill on that. Um, and so, you know, how if you do want to start social media, um, yeah. and poke fun and make fun of things. Um, hopefully uh, not in a bad way, um, but it portrays uh, that portrays yourself as to who you are. <laughs> um, and then most importantly for me, it's my kids and my family um, and how I can kind of. I showcase them in my social media platforms. Um, and so, you know, my kids actually really like it too, but here's just an yeah, example. Somebody, anybody, everybody screw. There's squirrels in my pants. That girl's got some furious squirrels in her pants. There's squirrels in my pants. <laughs> so for me, like, um, I, initially when I first started doing this, I thought maybe I'm just too all over the place. I'm doing education. I'm doing like silly videos. I'm doing like videos of my kids. I'm doing videos of my dogs. Is that like, that's not a niche, but it is a niche for me um, because it's just who I am. And so I think, you know, some people just only share their educational stuff, which is okay too. You don't have to divulge anything that you don't want to share on there, but realize when you do, you kind of opened yourself up to that. Um, and then, you know, of course, cars and talking about cars too. So that's one thing that I um, do on my platform too. But basically being successful is being authentic and there's only one of you and you've got to showcase yourself um, in your application. If you do have social media um, and just being true to yourself and, um, and unapologetically yourself, someone says something bad, that's fine. I mean, they no one, not 100% of people are going to like you. And that's true in all aspects of life, not just medicine. <laughs> Um, and you know, I treat my patients, how I treat my family. And these are all, um, uh, patients I've treated over the years that, um, uh, that I adore. And, uh, most importantly, treat your family, how you treat your patients, um, and treat your team, how you treat my patients, how you treat your patients. And, you know, just, just treat everybody with the respect and dignity of who they are. Um, and I think that'll take you a very long way. Um, and that's, you know, not just family and patients as nurses, it's, you know, people that are cleaning the rooms, it's everybody. They all deserve um, respect and dignity and um, compassion. Um, and ultimately, you know, patients will choose a provider that they bond with, and that's not everybody. And I've learned, of, I still get feelings hurt sometimes if someone doesn't want me to be their doctor or they go get a second opinion and go with someone else, but that's just the way life is. So they need to feel comfortable with you just like you need to feel comfortable with them. Um, so that is all I have. Um, and I just thank you guys all for listening to me. And like I said, if you have any questions about anything that I, I'll do my best to answer, um, I often can't respond to every single one, but, um, I, and I do have, um, someone that helps me respond to messages too. So, um, anyway, just good luck with everything and thanks for letting me, um, jibber jabber here today. And, um, and yeah, we'll talk, talk later.